Good morning, everyone. Dear delegates, faculty, staff, and students, a very special welcome to the 10th Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. And we are truly honored to have with us today our distinguished guest of honor, Padma Shri Renana Jhabwala. We will begin with the lighting of the lamp that will brighten up our paths and guide us towards truth and knowledge. Asatoma Sadgamaya Amasoma Jyotirgamaya Rityurma Amritam Gamaya Salvation Swastir Babatu Salvation Shantir Babatu Salvation Purnam Babatu Salvation Mangalam Babatu Loka Samasta Sukino Babantu Shanti We now have a small video that will show you uh, our tribute to Suresh Tendulkar. I now invite Professor Jyoti Chandiramani for her opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Sudipa. Um, a very warm welcome to uh, Renana Jhabwala, the chief guest for today's 10th Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. A very, very warm welcome to my faculty, my students, guests who have come to attend today's lecture. Uh, and a little brief as to why we have the Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture at SSE. Before I begin, I welcome Sunetra Tendulkar, who's on Zoom, uh, the wife of late Sri Suresh Tendulkar. Um, both he and both Sunetra ji and Sai have been uh, very supportive in us. Uh, you know, having this uh, 
uh, Tendulkar Memorial Lecture and what began in 2014 uh, and has come up till 2023. And in the 11th year, 2021, we'll come out with a book which would talk about the 10 lectures and various other facets that would enrich a book in, in memory of late Suresh Tendulkarji. In Pune, there are three great economists, you know, that I, I think of of stage show. Uh, one is none other than Dr. V.M. Dandekar. And when I was at the Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce as the head of the economics department, we had instituted, uh, you know, Dr. V.M. Dandekar Memorial Lecture Series over there. In 2010, when I came to SSE, I left behind that legacy and felt something has to be done at Symbiosis School of Economics. During that period in 2010-11, Professor Tendulkar, I got to know from the economics fraternity over here that he had moved to Pune and we were just launching onto our MSc program. And therefore, given that in mind, we thought we would get him to mentor us. But unfortunately, before we, our MSc program commenced, uh, Professor Tendulkar passed away and therefore we didn't have the uh, privilege and honor of his presence in person at SSC. But in our own way, I acknowledge that he is like a chair professor with us. His very presence has, you know, helped us attract good academicians and researchers in the field of poverty, inequality, which has great intersectionality in, in terms of bringing great speakers to come and talk to students because we feel as a school of economics we have we owe a lot to our country which is on the development path so given this backdrop we um, instituted the tendulkar memorial lecture a bit about professor suresh tendulkar ji born in kolapur district in maharashtra he's done his education right up to graduation in pune from none other than the BMCC College, which is just one kilometer down the road. He completed his master's in economics and statistics from Delhi School of Economics, completed his PhD from Harvard, joined um, ISI, and then came to Delhi School of Economics, his own alma mater, and was there between 1978 and 2004. 2004. Um, in between, he had even created a curriculum, I'm sure, which uh, I'd ask Kalyan to look into at some point because we would like to create something like this at our end, economic development and policy in India. We do touch upon it, but we should see what Suresh Tendulkar had created during that period with Professor Sundaram. And uh, Professor Tendulkar has been known to being a part of various committees, be it uh, the chairman of the National Commission of Statistics, Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, NSSO, Committee on the National Accounts, Fifth Pay Commission, and it goes on. Uh, he's known for his estimations of poverty. And um, I think he left his work. It was a work in progress because he revisited his own work, you know, and um, Revisiting work is always required. Even when we work on projects, we revisit the work. And I think that work was incomplete because he had submitted a revisited work on the realistic uh, food guarantee scheme and the estimations of poverty. Um, but unfortunately, he breathed his last in June 2011. Given this backdrop, uh, you know, why does SSE really uh, give in so much of an emphasis to uh, poverty and we feel that we give a lot of emphasis to the SDGs and we feel poverty has its linkages with all the 17 SDGs in some way or the other. And today when we are having Renana ma'am here, you know, going to tell us her views uh, about the wonderful work she's done from the late seventies to date on women empowerment, uh, maybe she could even tell us what she thinks about the latest poverty estimates. I don't know how many of you see the poverty world clock, you know, and uh, you will see how people are walking out of poverty. And yet the way poverty is defined is so different each time because um, you've seen how the multidimensional poverty index from 2010 gave it a more holistic picture where you have almost 12 parameters which are included. 
And then the poverty numbers that, that stood in 2011-12 for India, which as per Angarajan report was 363 million, compared to Professor Tendulkar's numbers at 270 million, almost an 83 million, um, you know, short come out there. And that led, you know, all the, these discussions on poverty is led to the food security bill of 2013, where you felt that, you know, food has to be at the, uh, you know, uh, available to households very easily. And you can see how that was even worked on during the COVID times. And today you have the World Bank talk about $1.9, then they talked about $2.2 or $2.15 as the poverty index or the threshold level. It goes beyond in discussions to $3.2 and $5.2. And the latest McKinsey report, which has come out in 2023, talks about a 12 per day in PPP, you know, terms, views for extreme poverty line and, and which, which the World Bank talks about $2.15. So there's a lot that has been changed and how is the world going to cope with this to bring about equity? Uh, these are unanswered questions. We expect our students to take some of you who are going to get into the development space. Um, even if you are not into the development space and you get into corporate world, you may probably be associated with some CSR project which would make lives of others more livable. I think given this backdrop, this is where we did come up with the Professor Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. So welcome to the 10th in the series and happy to be here and happy to welcome you once again, Rain Energy, on this very great occasion. Thank you. We are extremely happy to have with us today, Srimati Renana Jhabwala. She is a social worker and has been extensively involved in policy issues relating to poor women and the informal economy. She is a chairperson of SEVA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, and also a chairperson of SEVA Griharin Limited. In 1990, she was awarded the Padma Shri for her contributions in the field of social work. And in 2012, she became chancellor of Gandhi Gram Rural Institute. Renana Ma'am was born in Delhi to an illustrious family. Her mother was a novelist and a screenwriter who won the Booker Prize and also two Oscars for her screenplays. These are some of her works. Her father was a well-known architect and a professor at the School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi. And here are, are some of his works as an architect and also as an artist. Renana Ma'am graduated from Hindu College, University of Delhi with a distinction in mathematics. Then she attended Harvard University to pursue an additional degree in maths and then went on to Yale University for her post-graduation in economics. She returned to India in 1977 and joined Seva in Ahmedabad in that same year. 
1981, she was elected Secretary of Seva and was active in fostering the growth of Seva across India. In 1995, she became the National Coordinator of Seva and was one of the founders of the Mahila Housing Seva Trust. In 2002, she became the chair of Seva Bank and in, helped to increase finance for poor women across India. She represented Seva at the ILO in 1995, formed the HomeNet South Asia, bringing together organizations in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. She has played an active role in formulating policies, ranging from national policy for street vendors to the law for social security of unorganized workers. She has been a member of the Task Force on Affordable Housing at the Ministry of Housing and Poverty Alleviation, member of the Prime Minister's National Skill Development Council, chairperson of the Task Force on Workers in Unorganized Sectors, Government of Madhya Pradesh, member of the Task Force on National Policy for Street Vendors, chairperson of the Group of Women Workers and Child Labor, National Commission of Labor, Government of India. She is a board member of the Institute of Human Development and also with the Indian Institute of Human Settlements. She was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by FIKI Ladies Organization, India Today Women in Public Service by India Today Group. Her outstanding work in social service was awarded by the Vineet Gupta Memorial Trust and she was awarded the Padma Shri by the Government of India in 1990. Here are some of the books written by Renana Ma'am. And in fact, we can um, also see Uma Rani as being one of the co-authors. Uma had been an integral part of our international conference earlier this year. These are a few glimpses of the huge amount of work on women empowerment that is being carried out by SEWA. I now request Jyoti Ma'am to felicitate our chief guest. Please welcome Renana Chabwala, our chief guest for the 10th Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. Yeah, That's so fine. you have this so you can uh, move forward with this. Uh, can I just move yeah, it yeah, directly? Sure, sure, sure. Good morning, everybody, and um, especially to the director and deputy director of the SSE. Thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me. And Welcome to you all to this, uh, to what I have to say. Uh, before I start, I do want to tell you that, uh, <clears throat> can, is it showing up? Yeah, yeah, showing up. I do want to tell you that um, what I'm going to say is based partly a lot on experience, on what I personally have experienced. And as you heard, I have been in SEVA since actually 1978, before many of you were born, and perhaps before your mothers were born also. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, I also have brought in studies and concepts that are in uh, use today. So I've tried to mix the two and I hope it'll work. 
So my, what I'm going to talk about is women work and poverty. And let me start with Dr. Ten Lulkar. As you heard, he's well known for the poverty line, uh, which gives us the size and extent of poverty. What is less well known and what he didn't do very much of, but definitely recognized, is that the role of women is important uh, in alleviating poverty and that women have the potential to be powerful agents of change because when they start earning an income and when they are able to assert, then they put more income into the family and they bring up the uh, standard of living. So that is sort of what he did say about women. I, um, as he uh, as passed away early, uh, it's unfortunate that we were not able to speak to him to extend his argument more. However, in my talk, I am going to focus on women and, but not only, I'm going to really focus on structural causes of poverty and how they especially affect women. So, and here is where I want to a little bit diverge from what you were saying, uh, ma'am, uh, and what Suresh Tendulkar was focusing on. His work focused on looking at consumption and expenditure, both of which, of course, consumption expenditure, uh, both of which, of course, relate, correlate with poverty. So obviously, uh, when you're poor, you're spending less for your own consumption. That is important because knowing how many poor people there are, how much people are spending is important for creating a safety net. But looking at consumption doesn't provide, doesn't take us deeper into the structural causes of poverty. It just tells us, well, this person is poor because they're spending less and therefore we need a safety net for them. So I would like to diverge. And what is the alternative? Now, employment is one indicator that people often correlate with poverty. But, and for example, in South Africa, sorry, I'm just looking at the time. In South Africa, uh, the unemployment rate is 33%. And it correlates very strongly with poverty. The unemployed are poor. Um, but in India, you know, our poverty rate is very low. Uh, sorry, our unemployment rate is very low. It's only about four to five percent, 4.1, I think the last count. So you can say the lack of employment, unemployment itself does not correlate with poverty. Okay, so if unemployment doesn't correlate with poverty, what does? And that is where we see incomes and assets. Um, and what I feel and what I have seen, and now I revert to the personal, when you work with people who are poor, and when I say poor, I don't mean absolutely starving. I mean, who don't, don't have their basic needs, who are not able to provide a good education to their children, who don't live in houses, where they have their joint toilet, where the rain comes in when it rains, where it's hot to the extent of 50 degrees in the summer. That's a type of poverty. And in one way, I really feel that poverty is a violence caused by the system. It's a systemic violence. Um, it's callous, it's cruel. So, uh, and that's my view on what poverty does to people and what, where it comes from. Now, going back to what does correlate with poverty, the average earnings, this is the average earnings throughout, not for poor people, but the average earnings of people in casual labor is 374 rupees per day. I think this is 21, 22. Um, it's 374 rupees per day. Uh, and that you can imagine what is about 10,000 rupees a month or less. Can you live on that? 
In self-employment, it's a little higher, but self-employment also includes the shopkeepers and the bigger traders and the wholesalers and so on. So they pull it up a little bit. It's uh, about almost 12,000 rupees per month. And in regular salaried employment, which includes, of course, the corporate sector, but also includes those in factories paid much less, it is about uh, 18,000 rupees a month. Um, so if you begin to think of what uh, 10,000 rupees or 11,000 rupees can take you, how far can it take you, given education, given electricity, given water, given all the bills you have to pay, and given, of course, the, the basic, the food, you do find a very high malnourishment, for example, among at least 50% of our population, because you know, people will draw off money, draw money off food uh, for these other things. Education is very highly valued. But when we look at earnings, women are much more, worse off than men. For example, I have figures for all, but I won't read all of them. For example, the earnings of men in self-employment is 2.6 times higher than an average woman's earnings. Um, ownership of assets, and in our country, assets is mostly land and buildings. Of course, they are financial assets, but if you count the value of the land and buildings are much higher. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail. We know that the lowest 50% uh, of the population possesses only 3% of the wealth of this nation. So <clears throat> the ownership of assets, again, is very low. And so what I'm trying to say here is that incomes and assets is what correlates with poverty. And why and what can we do about higher incomes and higher assets? So on the one hand, we have the safety net coming, which is where uh, Professor Tendulkar's work came. But on the other hand, we have the low income and assets, which keeps the need for that safety net continuous. I now want to go a little bit into where I am coming from, which is SEVA, uh, and that's the Self-Employed Women's Association. And I think what SEVA has tried to do in its own, I sh should point out limited way, because without the resources and without like without the kind of resources the government has, SEVA can do so much, but it does show the way to address the systemic poverty. What is SEVA? It's called Self-Employed Women's Association. It actually builds on a very old legacy, uh, which is the legacy started by Gandhiji in Ahmedabad and uh, a lady called Ansuya Sarabhai, who started organizing mill workers um, maybe a hundred, more than a hundred, 110, 20 years ago, 110 years ago, I'm sorry. And this uh, association, they formed a trade union called Textile Labor Association. And my founder, <coughs> Ila Ben Bhatt, was working in the Textile Labor Association when a number of unorganized workers or workers who are not recognized as workers, un who are rec unrecognized, cart pullers, waste pickers, street vendors, they began coming to her and saying, can't you organize us? Can't we have a association? Um, and so in 1972, uh, the Self-Employed Women's Association was born. Its actual name is in Gujarati, but you will understand it because it's uh, almost from any language. The actual name of Seva is not Seva. The actual name is Swashrai Mahila Seva Sang. Swashrai means by her own labor. Uh, Mahila, we all know. Seva means it's not there to make money, but to serve. And Sang means organizing, coming together. So it was translated into English as Self-Employed Women's Association. And these women sort of came together. They are severely underpaid. They were not acknowledged even as workers. Only uh, people in the formal sector were workers. And coincidentally, 
1972, which is when Seva was registered, now 51 years ago, the ILO introduced the term informal sector. And that was the first time the term informal sector was used. And since then, in a way, the informal sector and SEVA have grown together. And not the informal sector as such, but the knowledge on the informal sector. Though, in fact, the informal sector has grown. In, all over the world, the informal sector has grown over the last uh, 50 years. SEVA's strategy, SEVA found that women became empowered if they organized, that is, if they came together. A woman alone is very disempowered, especially in poorer communities. She, in a way, she doesn't even have her own personality. Um, but if they come together, if they discuss together, they feel stronger and they come together in collectives, which I'll tell you about later. Um, <clears throat> so what is a collective? As I told you, SEVA was formed in 72. It was formed as a trade union a trade union where women come together and look for a better life, look for their rights. An interesting point is when we went to register the trade union, we were told, well, there is no employer. How are you going to have a trade union? And the argument that Ila Ben put forward was, well, we are not doing a trade union against an employer. We are doing it for the workers. And that has been the philosophy of SEVA. So SEVA formed a trade union of women informal workers, but that was not enough because they had no rights anyway. There were no laws for them. So we started forming what we call cooperative organizations. So proper cooperatives, and in more recent years, um, companies where women work together in a company. And our first, in fact, SEVA is the founder of the microfinance movement in India because Seva Bank, which is a proper bank, which is still functioning, which is an A-grade bank, um, was formed in 1975. And after that, many other cooperatives were formed. Slowly in the 80s, Seva spread outside Gujarat. It's now in 17 states. And every year we take a membership of each woman. And so far we have a membership of 25 lakh women. And we have formed over 160 cooperatives. I'd be happy to talk about SEVA uh, with anybody who would be interested. Uh, let me go back. So one of the things that we realized that it was necessary to visibilize the women who work. And the women who work are the female labor force. You know, in the NSS, it is the female labor force participation. Um, <clears throat> now, official statistics, you may have coming from the School of Economics, uh, you may all have heard about the um, labor force participation of women in India is falling, it's very low. And I think 21-22 is 25% uh, of women are working. <clears throat> but our experience is different. I think many of you who may have gone to the villages or even in the urban areas, you see, do see with your own eyes women's working. We have done micro studies, others have done micro studies, and we find that the 25% number, which we have to accept as gospel truth, is actually contradicts what we see ourselves. And let me give you an example. Um, we did a study in Bihar with the Bihar government. Uh, it was on women in the informal economy in Bihar. I think it was 11, 12, no, 12, 13. And uh, 2012, 2013. And uh, we found, and um, <clears throat> you know, when you go to Bihar, which some of you may have gone, I hear you've done studies in Bihar, you see women working in the fields, you go to the rural areas, it's more rural than urban. You go to the rural areas, you see women with cattle, you see women with goats, you see women working in the fields, you see them with your own eyes. But what does the NSS say? That 9.4% women are working. Do you think it's true that 90% of women in Bihar are not doing anything productive? I don't think it's true. 
Um, and we therefore did a study. We asked IHD uh, to do a study and they found with the same question, it was closer to 56%, not 9.4%. That's more believable. Um, at this point, let me just say, let me just see what I have further on. Okay. Uh, at this point, let me say a little bit about the definitions. I don't want to go into the definition right now, but the NSS definition of productive work is work that is done for paid for uh, earning for for market or for any kind of payment. I'm just paraphrasing. Or, and this is particularly true in India, uh, it is also, as per NSS, work done for self-consumption in farms, with livestock, with fisheries, and there are two or three others. So uh, for own consumption, uh, for certain types of categories, especially rural categories, and anything that is done for payment. So this 56% uh, was basically all those women working in the farms. I give you another example, which is urban. This was more rural. And this is just an experience-based example. We, in, we have a Seva Delhi. I told you we work in 17 states. Each state has its own Seva. So we have a Seva Delhi. And in Seva Delhi, we have 63,000 home-based work. Sorry, uh, we have 72,000 home-based workers. I'll explain what home-based workers are later. But we have 72,000 of them who have been our members last year. Uh, one of the, uh, um, <clears throat> there is an organization called WIGO, Women in Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing, based at Harvard University. And they do a lot of studies. Uh, and one of their studies was an analysis of the NSS for Delhi. And they found that the NSS said that there were 63,000 female home-based workers. We ourselves work in 10% of Delhi. Similarly, the NSS said there are 12,000 street vendors in Delhi. We already have 10,000 members. So, you know, there is a mismatch. I know I'm uh, saying something that people, I've said this for many years, but people then go back to the NSS. Yes, they must be right because they are the NSS. But why does it happen? Why is the NSS not picking up these women? And that is where a very important thing is happening. In the case of women, the boundary between reproductive work and productive work gets blurred. The boundary between um, cooking, cleaning, uh, care at home, that's what I would call reproductive work. And productive work, which as defined by the NSS is either paid work or work for her own consumption in the farm or livestock or fisheries, et cetera. Those two get blurred and women themselves don't acknowledge their own work. They don't acknowledge the work. So when the NSS person comes and says, what do you do? They said, we don't do anything. But since that is the mindset, the policymakers don't acknowledge the work, the market does not acknowledge the work, the family does not acknowledge the work. And because they see this productive work as defined by the NSS as really being reproductive work. What can we do? And one of the things Seva has done right from the beginning is saying your women need to build their own identity. Now you know, um, <clears throat> now you know that women often don't even have an identity in that their name is not called. As many of us have been to village areas, um, even urban areas, and we see that a woman is referred to as uh, Ramu Kima or so, so Lakshman Killarki. So they are not referred to as themselves. I'm not Mala, I am not um, Mahima. I am somebody's mother, I'm somebody's wife. I'm not a worker. I'm just somebody who works in the home. 
And therefore, the first thing is to start the process of social change in the woman's own self-consciousness. And we do that in Seva through training programs where she learns to identify herself. We actually do the training saying, what's your name? And you know, sometimes they have great difficulty saying, Mira naam mala hai. They, they sort of giggle and quite shy and then they take a little while and they do it. And then you find out what do you actually work at? You ask again, what do you do? What do you work? She's a domestic worker. She has her own farm. So then she learns to identify herself as Mira naam mala hai. Main um, sabji bechti hu. Aur main uh, bapu nagar mein rehti hu. So just these three things when she learns, she looks at herself in a different way and her family begins to look at herself in a different way. Um, and then when women come together and they all identify themselves in that way, then there is a real change within them. But you know, of course, just changing their minds is not enough. Societies and society and policymakers have to be convinced too. So I'm giving two examples, which I want to um, give you to show you how this can happen. And let me do that. And this is the case of home-based workers. Uh, who is a home-based worker? I have been using that term. Home-based workers are those who produce goods and services for sale within their own homes. Something like garments, a, a, a handwork like embroidery or making toys, uh, incense sticks, food products, electronics, beadies, all types of things. And when we make a list, you find that there are many, many different types. They can be piece rated. That is a contractor will give them work and they will get per piece rate or they can be self-employed, which means that they make it, they buy the um, raw materials, they make it and they sell it. So these are home-based workers. Um, <clears throat> and you would think you don't really see them. Let me go ahead. And how are they viewed? This is the words of a contract, not one contract. This is a word every time we have worked with home-based workers, these are the words that the contractors use. These women are not workers. They are only housewives doing some work in their spare time for extra money. And we give them some work. They should be grateful for whatever they get. And that's the way that they're viewed. Just a quick chart. You would not believe these figures, but it's true. BD rolling, which is the highest paid actually among piece rated home-based work is 110 rupees per day maximum is what she would earn. Papad making, depending on the type of papad, she would earn maximum 180. And then there are other things like, we found something called moti tar work, which is just soldering, um, in their own home, soldering little conductors in their own home, and they get 30 rupees a day. So, you know, it's work, they work long hours, and this is what they get. And that's the example of low incomes. Um, the home-based worker, woman worker is at the base of the production pyramid. Her home is her workplace, which is why the blurring is all the more. All expenses are paid by her, the electricity, etc., And she has no means of social security. And as I showed you, she earns far less than the minimum wage. Uh, this is even the worker will say, I, I myself have been in a house where a woman is sewing some garments behind. I know she's sewing it for a contractor. I know she works at least six to seven hours a day. And a uh, husband is sitting there and I'm asking him, so this is the mindset. And the woman will say the same. That's the thing. She's invisibilized, not counted in data, and therefore missing in policy and legal frameworks. What has been our approach? The first thing, as I told you, was worker consciousness. I won't repeat that. But to make the woman herself more conscious of who she is, that she is a worker, that she's working eight hours a day. We have a very interesting way to do that. And I think you would find it interesting that we do research. So we have surveys and our grassroots workers, and we do have grassroots researchers, they go out and they ask the woman, what do you do for six, uh, what do you do 
you know, during the day. It's, it's not quite a time you study. It's more focused on her work. And then when she says, I sew garments, then you ask how many hours, how much do you spend, et cetera. And you make her conscious that she actually is a worker. The other parts that I want to talk about is how do we make the policymakers conscious? And one of our earliest uh, ways was actually going international because we discovered that home-based workers exist in many countries. And there are some organizations of home-based workers. So we came together and we managed, it's a long story how, but we managed to get an ILO convention on home-based workers. And that convention internationally still stands. It's not been translated into law in India, but we hope at some point. The second thing we were able to do was to include home-based workers in the NSS data. How do you do that? By including one question on the place of work. Once you include a question on the place of work, then you can analyze all those who work in their homes. And the last way, of course, is what I have been saying in the beginning, which is we organize, we bring people together. And what we have done is we have formed, of course, SEVA itself has formed organizations of home-based workers, but we helped formed in different South Asia countries. And very recently, a HomeNet International has been registered from, uh, with organizations from Latin America, different countries of Africa, Southeast Asia and Asia, and even from Europe. So, um, <clears throat> so visibilizing involves formation of these organizations so that they become visible, inclusion in the data, by the way, uh, India has about four crores, according to NSS now, for about four crores home-based workers, 40 million. Uh, bringing about a convention so that they become internationally known. And that's visibilizing. No, it's not enough. You have to increase incomes. How do you do that? You negotiate with the contractors, you help the women organize. Um, <clears throat> for example, in just one small example, in Bikaner, there are a lot of papad workers. Bikaner, as you know, is famous for papad. And all the women uh, of below a certain income, lower income groups are making papad. But they were getting very low rates. So we did a study. We found out what the rates were. We publicized them in the newspaper. Hearing this, a lot of women came together. Coming together, they then themselves started thinking, okay, well, we should not get this, we should get this much. They approached the contractors and the owners and slowly over time, their rates have increased yearly. Um, but another more powerful way or a very powerful way is forming collectives. So we, women come together, they begin producing together and selling together. Uh, recently, not so recently, maybe about eight years ago in Delhi, for example. I mean, we have many of these examples. I'm just giving you one. Uh, women who do uh, embroidery and Ari work came together in Delhi, in Bihar, and in Bengal, three areas. And they formed a company called Ruab, which means pride. And this company, um, they pool their work and the company helps them to sell it. So that is the way we form collectives. When I earlier said we have 160 cooperative organizations, that's the kind of organization we have. And finally, for a home-based worker, her home is her asset, is her work asset. So improvement and ownership of home is extremely important. Um, <clears throat> And um, in fact, uh, 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 we don't have, as I said, Seva is not working actually in Pune, but we do have one thing that we do in Pune, which is we have set up a, a housing finance company called Sitara. And Sitara has branch in Pune and hopefully will be having much more expansion in Pune. Um, and through this, she can get a loan to own a new home, or to improve her home. So these are the approaches that we have been able to use to visibilize, to increase income, and to strengthen assets. And we think this is something that can be scaled up. I think this is the Ruab I was talking about. 
Um, I'm going to skip this one. The second case I want to talk about is the case of women farmers. Now, <clears throat> women and men both work on the family farm. However, it is the man who is counted as the farmer. And you see this, uh, you know, in the media, when a farmer is portrayed, it's always a man with a turban. Um, Sometimes they're very old fashioned and have him holding a plow. And sometimes they are uh, not plow, what's that digging instrument. And sometimes they are a little bit more um, forward looking and have him sitting on a tractor, but it's always the man. Why? Because a farmer is defined by the person who owns the land. And only 14% of women are owning agriculture land and they only own 11% of the farmland. So the woman works on the farm, but she's not a farmer. By not counting them as farmers, what do we do? We make sure that they're not visible, so they're not in the data, and they don't have access to productive assets. So, you know, more and more men are leaving farms. Farming is not very lucrative. Overall, especially if it's a small farm, it's not very lucrative. So the man will go and do some other job where he can get an earning or he'll do self-employment like a shop. And it's the woman who then looks after the farm, but she's not a farmer. <clears throat> so she does not get any subsidies. She does not get technology. She does not get good input seeds. And so her incomes as a farmer will always remain depressed. So if a farm income is depressed, hers is depressed even further. And uh, since we are not aiming any of the um, growth elements towards her, and since the man is not there, we are actually not doing a favor to agriculture. Traditionally, in agriculture, there's men's work and women's work. Uh, women's work is, of course, always more laborious, transplanting, weeding, etc. However, as men has moved away from agriculture, women have taken up farm work associated with men, such as irrigation, plowing, digging. Um, and many of them have become the primary worker in the family farms. We had a very interesting, I was in Punjab recently, we had gone to the rural areas and spraying pesticides is a man's task. So all you see is the men in the fields with the tanks on their back. Um, <coughs> but it's the women who prepare the tanks and who mix the pesticides and then who get it all ready and then the men go and spray the field. So is the woman involved? Is she a farmer? Is she not a farmer? This is just an example. And this is an, uh, in Bihar. I told you we did this study in Bihar. So this was this uh, woman called Bidhani Devi and she was making dung cakes when we visited. And we asked about her work and her husband was standing there uh, and she said, Ki mere pati se pooch lije. please ask my husband. But then when we insisted, no, no, we want to talk to you only, then she stopped doing her work. So she said uh, she had a buffalo, two ox, 10 katha of land. She does sowing, weeding, harvesting. She takes care of the cattle, but she doesn't count herself as work. We said, aren't you a worker? She said, no, it's part of her domestic duties. So that whole blurring, I keep coming back to this blurring. What do we do? We visibilize women farmers, again, through worker consciousness training, which I've already told you about. But you know, in many uh, states, um, the government does register farmers. So it is necessary for these women to get together and go to the registration process. Usually now it's online and convince them that even though they're women, it's their family farm, and therefore they should be registered. And I am happy to say that after, of course, after a lot of convincing, uh, people do get, the government people do get convinced and women start registering themselves. So they get some kind of recognition as a farmer. <coughs> Excuse me. And once they're recognized as a farmer, they get seeds, they get fertilizers, they even get training. We also help them increase incomes uh, through improved agriculture techniques, uh, then access, of course, to subsidized inputs. 
And of course, one of the important things is to give them loans, both for farming, as well as to improve their land ownership, either by buying land, or very often you will find that they have mortgaged their land. So to get the land back in their own name. And farm equipment is very important. So collective ownership of farm equipment. And this is one example of a woman who is learning, or she's not learning now, of course, uh, transplanting rice, rather than, I don't know, many of you would have seen those pictures of transplanting, where women are all bent over, standing in water, knee deep, with you know all kinds of insects floating around, and uh, hour after hour after hour transplanting. So this is another way of transplanting. And this is a lot of women now are owning this kind of equipment, but it's a collective and they have to, they do it collectively. Um, as I mentioned, organizing and mobilizing is very necessary for impact. Um, so what does that mean? It means that they come together to identify themselves as workers, as farmers, as home-based workers, as street vendors. Um, <clears throat> they, once they begin their own identity, they are able to advocate for themselves. So then they are able to talk to the collector or the commissioner or the, um, or the sarpanch. Um, and they are then able to ask for improved conditions. They are able to ask for narega. They are able to ask for seeds. So they begin to advocate for themselves. They also are able to pool resources. This is very common for finance. You've seen SHGs. They all pool their savings. They get loans. And it's a form of pooling. Um, I showed you the example of the uh, collective company, Ruab. They pool their work, they pool their resources and buy shares, and they are able to then, as a collective, actually reach a much higher market. They're able to move up the supply chain. The collective is also a safe place. Um, we know that women are often told not to go out much. They themselves are fearful. Many women are very fearful and fearful that their bodies will be attacked at any time or they will be shamed. But when women come together, it creates a safe space where they feel they can be themselves. And so the practice of organizing women is about ensuring that every woman, and I'm talking about those in the informal sector, has the tools, support, and platform to lead a life of dignity, respect, and economic independence. This is how we see it. And this is just a small meeting. I think it's in Jharkhand. Now, what are some of the challenges to mobilizing? Um, <clears throat> one of the challenges, and it's a challenge and an opportunity. I uh, don't want to say it's purely a challenge, is digital. That as digital assets are increasing, mobile phones, the access to digital assets is much less for women than it is for men. If there is a smartphone in the house, the woman will not have it. It's the man who will have it. And therefore the knowledge that comes with that, the access that comes with that does not go to her. And the way that we are trying to deal with it is to ensure that women are buying their own mobile phones. Uh, after all, a smartphone is not that expensive. And to ensure that she uses it productively. And we find many very small entrepreneurs, self-employed women using it to um, sell their goods and services. We also find you know, young girls using it to learn how to give tuition so that they can pay for their own education. Um, we also use, uh, have been using it a lot for messages. During COVID, the mobile phone was the main way that women were telling each other about how to be safe. Um, so this is something because she doesn't have it, therefore the gap, the digital gender gap is widening. And so from SEVA, we make a big effort to uh, lessen that gap because that gap also in, uh, constitutes a knowledge gap, an access gap, a resource gap. 
And we think that really needs to be scaled up. How do you make women not only more digitally literate, but have that asset in their hand? Um, and this is also an opportunity because you can reach far more people, get far more knowledge if you do have that asset. But a real problem that we face is the caste discrimination and the religious differences. So the caste discrimination, you know, when you want to bring women together of different castes, uh, I don't have to spell out for you that many uh, people from <clears throat> many people, men and women from somewhat higher caste, we mostly work, with, don't work with very high caste because manual workers are not very high caste, but they are very scornful of Dalits, let me be very frank. And drinking water, sitting together, that is something that we have to, I won't even say enforce, but teach. And we do it not in a forceful way, but I just give you one, two small examples. One is an example in uh, Gujarat, where we started having creches for women because they needed it, they asked for it. But in the villages, people live within their different castes. So we um, said that we are going to have it in the Dalit area. So the higher caste women said, who are not very high caste, but still said that we won't come. And said, that's too bad. But then the creche was run, it was clean, it was good. And one by one, all the women from different castes began to put their children there. Similarly, of course, within or say by itself, we insist everybody sits together, has tea together, eats each other's lunch boxes. R religious differences are even more difficult with the atmosphere today. And we find, again, to be frank, um, women from the, uh, not only women, but the uh, people from the Muslim communities have become very scared and distrustful uh, about people who come to visit them. And so the kind of unity that we were building and are building uh, are getting, the fabric is getting torn or worn. And so we have to make special efforts. One of the things that we always do and has been traditional and comes from Gandhiji's time is um, <clears throat> that we have an all religious prayer. So just by saying an all religious prayer from three or four religions together, one after the other, we show that we respect all religions. And then of course, the same thing that you need to respect, need to go into each other's areas. You need to respect each other's mannerisms, dress and food. So this is one thing that is really tearing the mobilizing or the organizing apart. Uh, this is, I've come to the last thing that I want to say, which is I go back to the kind of poverty we see is systemic violence. And without addressing the structural causes of the disempowerment, of the poverty, of the invisibility, we cannot scale up change. I mean, we do it in Seva in a small way. We have 25 lakh women. What is that in a country of our size? And we do see the callousness and cruelty of the system. Um, once we start working with these deeper structures, we need to understand the underlying forces which give rise to such structures and the ideologies that shape them. We don't have the competence to undertake such analysis. Maybe, you know, you are thinkers, maybe you will, or maybe you already have begun to think of such things. But in SEVA, as we are an action organization, we do need to think about a different vision of society. And we base our thinking on what we are seeing through our work. What are we seeing emerging through the work? Um, and the lessons that we have learned from our work at SEVA uh, is that it's the economic system I mean, it's also a social system and so on, but our focus more is on the economic system, a more humane economic system. What does that mean? It means cooperation rather than only competition. Cooperation among people, cooperation among groups of people, people understanding each other. That leads to a deeper understanding and less divisions. And another very important point is the 
caring for those who are weaker or more vulnerable. And I think this was one of Gandhiji's thing, uh, uh, lessons that think of the poorest person you know, and would your action help that person? So how do you focus in on the poor, on those who are more vulnerable, those who are weak? And we feel that is an answer to both the callousness and greed. So what we need is an economy which prioritizes nurturance, nurturance of people, nurturance of resources, we were talking about local area planning, planning from below, that's nurturance. Um, finance can nurture and finance can destroy. So nurturance along with growth, I don't say no growth, of course we need growth, but what does growth mean? And how do you come, how can you have a nurturing growth? And a process of interaction, which prioritizes cooperation over competition and exploitation. And I'll end here. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I have a little bit dramatic thing at the end. If we are serious about the systemic violence these women are facing, that indeed all poor are facing, we need to be moving towards a more humane economic system. Um, and um, I, you know, this is what I have found from my experience. And from our experience, we have also challenged many of the economic structures and also the economic concepts. And I hope we will be allies in doing that. Thank you all very much. Thank you so, so much. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you so much, ma'am. This was, um, personally for me, this was uh, very moving. Of course, it was eye-opening for many, many of us. And it was also um, so heartening to see that there are people like you, you who are uh, doing revolutionary work at the grassroots level. And yes, we must give her a standing ovation. Dear students, exactly what we feel that you need to be doing in whichever world you are in, in whichever life you are in, whatever you're doing, please ensure that you lift people above from where they are. Thank you. Students, please be seated. Uh, we will now take up questions and answers uh, and a discussion if you want. Um, we already have some questions that were submitted. So can I please call upon Anvi Vatal from the BSc 2225 batch? Anvi, are you in the auditorium? Yes. Please ask your question. Yeah. I <clears throat> Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, so good morning, ma'am. Uh, my name is Anavi Vatil and I'm from BSc second year. So first of all, as we know that women often don't, uh, don't take credit of their own work, for their own work. So that means I would like to congratulate Seva for do, making them own their own work. Also, my question is based more upon urban setting that you talked about rural uh, informal sector, but if we talk about uh, the formal sector or the, uh, the women uh, having a great career graphs, but don't you feel that they are not truly empowered? Like, what do you, uh, I would like to know your, you know your views on that, because as they're expected to do their work, do their work in their home also. So that way, so also, do you think any other policy should be implemented by the government for increasing, uh, for decreasing the uh, gender poverty? Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, would you like to take up all the questions and then answer, or will you? Okay, okay. Three questions. Okay. Um, uh, one of our faculty members, uh, Dr. Kushbu Thadani, also has a question. Uh, 
Good morning, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the wonderful insight. Uh, I'm basically from Shillong, Meghalaya, which is a Northeast state. So um, I have a very simple question. So since Seva has membership, uh, which is in two Northeast states also. So I just wanted to know that uh, if there are any observations with regard to the percentage of women's participation in the labor force as compared to other states in India, if that is different. And are the women more empowered in terms of having their identity over there? And are the challenges different? Thank you. Uh, may I call upon uh, Purvi Varma to address her question? Uh, good afternoon to all. Um, my name is Poojvi Verma and I'm a second year MSc student. Uh, as a summer intern at Seva Bharat itself, I have seen the works of the organization quite co closely. So my question for you, ma'am, is uh, what does Seva Bharat aims to do for the Agewans who have been a part of the organization for a long time, but now are not that active in the field work? Thank you. Can I take one more question? There will be four questions. Uh, Samriddhi Khare, BSc 21-24 batch, is she here? No. Um, Adi Panikar. Um, Ma'am, so the question was, uh, you touched upon economic inclusivity in today's world. Now in today's cutthroat world, how do we uh, uh, how do we achieve the idea of economic inclusivity in such a cutthroat world that today is? Dr. Nawaz would also like to ask a question. Uh, can we please have the microphone here? Uh, thank you, ma'am, for such an insightful lecture. And there is one question and one observation I want to make. I myself calculated the female level for participation. And I generally call it NSS female level for participation. The moment, the moment you include the you know scheduled tribe, scheduled caste, so majority of the fall or withdrawal in the female level for participation is solely you know explained by the scheduled tribe. The majority of the withdrawal is coming from the scheduled tribe. So that is the point I thoroughly reviewed the literature on it, and that is the point you know quite missing. The moment you include scheduled tribe, the withdrawal is, you know, half of the withdrawal is explained. The second question is that uh, there is a complete stagnation in the real wages. I calculated wages on the 2011-12 prices from uh, 55th round to the latest PLFS. And I found there is a complete stagnation, particularly on the casual labor and for the regular base salary on the lower decide. So there are theories in textbook, there are papers, but what is your insight from the ground that why we are observing such a stagnation in the real wages? Thank you. Uh, let me start with the, the first question that <clears throat> even if you don't talk about uh, women in the informal economy, but talk about women who are better off, uh, <clears throat> you still face a lot of issues uh, and withdrawal from the workforce because of uh, home issues. And uh, <clears throat> I have two separate answers for that, actually. My, the one answer which I feel very strongly is that in India, we have seen many changes, many uh, silent revolutions. Education has gone up, healthcare has gone up. The perception of women's education has totally changed. Um, earlier, you know, even women were not allowed to go to school. So those have changed. But what has not changed here and has changed in other countries is that men are not ready to do housework. <clears throat> so it's not that an individual man doesn't want to do housework. It's the whole society that men are not to do housework. Uh, women have to do housework. So 
that there's a slight change which I'm seeing that men do participate now in care of children. Not that much, not in very small children, but they do, will take their child to school, they'll bring back from school, they'll look at some of the uh, tuition and all that. But care work and uh, housework, for some reason, there has not been that major change in India. And I think it is up to you young women to keep uh, bringing that issue up. I, as we keep bringing up the issue of harassment on public spaces, we need to keep bringing up the issue that uh, after all, the home doesn't belong only to the woman, the home and the children belong to everybody, the men and the women. And both should be working. And that the, I think the change has to come from the head. As I was saying earlier, a woman's consciousness has to change. So people in society, their consciousness has to change. You know, it's not man do man work, woman housework. It's housework is everybody's responsibility. So I, I, this is a major change that is yet to come. It hasn't come. And you young people, it's, your, it's in your hands now. The other answer, of course, <clears throat> is that, uh, and that's, uh, that we need far more um, help that is from society. For example, um, most working women, and, and now I'm talking about informal sector women especially, but others also, don't really have access to creches to leave their children. Uh, good creches, clean creches, well-run creches. If you look in, say, some of the European countries, there are creches everywhere. They are well, well uh, regulated, standardized, um, and you know they, they <clears throat> teach the child, give the child stimulation as well as look after the physical needs. We don't have that, and that's very necessary if uh, if we if women need a helping hand. And of course, in the informal sector itself, water and sanitation, water cleanliness, sanitation. So if a woman has to spend a lot of time getting water, then uh, her work suffers tremendously. So I think those are sort of the answers I can think of. Um, <clears throat> and then let me just go, uh, I'm going to jump a little bit. Uh, the withdrawal of what Dr. Nawaz was saying, um, you said, you opposed one of my points and you uh, corroborated one of my points. The withdrawal of, um, of uh, uh, scheduled tribe women from the workforce. Uh, you know, what I have been seeing is, are they really withdrawing? I know NSS, what my whole challenge is to the NSS. Are the figures of the NSS correct? Have you gone and seen withdrawal women? Uh, have you gone to large numbers of tribal areas and seen that women are no longer working, who used to do? Yes, there have been major changes. One major change, and, and I'm not talking now about scheduled tribe in general, I'm talking in general, is the uh, massive ur urbanization so that rural women no longer have the opportunity, or women don't, no longer have the opportunity to do agriculture. And urban areas, women do, are doing less and less work, but most of the work is either home-based work or domestic work. Home-based work is invisible. So I am, you know, if you're quoting the NSS to me, uh, I don't think I would accept that as gospel truth. The stagnation of real wages, um, yes, I do think that has happened, but not necessarily. I was looking at the agriculture wages and they had, the real wages had gone up. Um, I, I'm not sure what is, uh, what the truth is because it depends which in the Rega wages has been going up, but other wages also have gone up, it, even the real wages. Why is my hand coming? <laughs> anyway, never mind. Oh, I see. So they're not seeing the hands. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm seeing four, I'm seeing four. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, uh, I think the issue is that uh, wages um, are being suppressed. 
you know, a lot of formal sector has become contract labor. A lot of people who used to work in the formal sector now have to work as contracts. Uh, and uh, the wages are about half of what uh, uh, formal sector wages are. Um, also, industry has become more and more uh, informal. And the more informal you get, the more you can squeeze the workers. Uh, migration has increased and it's easier to even use the word exploit migrant workers. So uh, I don't know if real wages have stagnated or when or what or so on. I mean, I, I, I don't know the figures of that, but uh, the low levels of the wages and the, and uh, of course, another thing is that the 12 hour working day, you know, now we have a law that you can work 12 hours, the 12 hour working day for the same wages. That's another thing that has um, going to um, the Northeast, you know, I wish I could say more. I myself have not been, I mean, you know, we have a big organization. So my own work is not that much in the Northeast. Um, uh, what, I, what my colleagues tell me is that uh, they're definitely more empowered. That's Definitely more important compared to what? Compared to Bihar or UP or MP, uh, maybe not so much in a different way compared to Tamil Nadu or uh, Karnataka, even Maharashtra. But uh, uh, we work a lot with the street vendors in the urban areas, and they face a lot of problems because there the land is not owned by. Uh, by the municipality, it's owned by the tribal council. And apparently, according to them, that is quite, they are quite patriarchal and don't want to give the land to the people. But I, I wish I could say more, but I really can't because I don't have the personal experience there. Um, then in today's world, <coughs> uh, how can you talk about inclusivity? I mean, you're right that, uh, uh, but you know, um, when you want change, you can't say that, well, things are like this, how can you change? You can't give up, you can't do that. Change comes by changing ideas, by people demanding change, by demonstrations like Seva of change is possible. So anybody, you know, you could have said a hundred years ago, why should you educate women? It's not important. Uh, you could have said that. And, you know, Saltri Bai Phule, why is she doing all this? Look how everybody thinks that women should not be educated. Why should she put herself out? You can say, you could have said that. And yet so many people, women demanded it. Um, some men promoted it uh, and the idea grew and today it's quite different. So society does change and doesn't change. God doesn't come down and change it. It's us who changes it. And finally, <clears throat> your very specific questions. Uh, her question is on Agivan. In Seva, we have women who are the leaders uh, and the leaders are from the community and we call them Agivans. Um, and some are not so active, uh, were active, but not active now. And I wish I could answer that question. I'm not sure what exactly you're talking about, but uh, I noticed that when women get older, they sometimes become less active or sometimes they get offended with each other. This is a big problem in organizing, by the way, that uh, very petty things offend people. He, she said this to me, I said this to her, she didn't do this to me and so on, and so I'm not coming. So that's another whole area which you have to keep overcoming that, you know, pettiness is, has no place in organizing. But, you know, if you give me specific examples of why people don't get active, then I can give you specific reason, uh, specific steps of what one can do. So I think I have gone over it. <clears throat> Any more questions? Anybody? 
वरुण I think cooperatives have. It, it's actually not true that they are only successful in Gujarat. We have very successful cooperatives in Maharashtra. We have successful cooperatives in Karnataka. Uh, we are running two cooperatives in Bihar and are facing quite a lot of problems. Uh, I think the cooperatives are successful where the regulation and laws allow them to be successful. But uh, regulation and laws are, have really clamped down on cooperatives. and therefore the new idea of a producer company came in because the companies act is far more uh, liberal in many ways than the cooperative act just to give you an example uh, again in bihar an example in bihar i have similar example in gujarat both the states to register a cooperative it takes almost one year to register a company you can do it within a month or less uh to if you register cooperative you can't work outside that state you register a company you can work anywhere in the country or even abroad so uh the company you know it, uh, that is actually part of the larger regulatory framework which is clamping down on cooperatives and promoting companies um and so within that to sort of duplicate the so nobody is changing the cooperative laws so instead instead to get out of that uh, the idea of a producer company uh, was uh, floated and i think it was registered in uh, or the law came in in 2000 uh, so the so the producer company sort of duplicates the uh, cooperative model without all the problems um and government has been promoting pharma producer uh, companies um i don't know if they've been promoting it in the sense of actually giving very large subsidies which they haven't but i think nabard helps sidbi helps so sidbi doesn't do pharma but they do other producer cooperatives um my experience in uh, producer company that duab i told you about is a producer company and we have a number of farm producer companies of women and i think whatever is the issues it's uh, as difficult or as easy uh, as a, a, a cooperative from the point of view that you know these are women who are not very um, very versed in in running an organization they are not very educated but they don't know how to do the regulations and even for companies there are a lot of regular gst for example gst is not easy so uh, it needs a lot of hand holding and in fact we have started over the last few years something called a women's enterprise support system which supports both the cooperatives and the producer companies since you asked me a question i say one more thing which is that uh, producer companies have one disadvantage as compared to other companies a company usually grows if it can take investments and producer companies can't take investments because they can only uh, take shares and poor people have limited capacity to pay for shares so uh, both producer companies and cooperatives have to rely only on loans they can't rely on investments um that someone is here also can you please introduce yourself and then ask the question quickly i'm rhythm i'm from bsc batch 2124 <coughs> my question is as you mentioned that the line between productive uh, work and reproductive work is blurring so 
to improve the statistics of women in labor force participation do you think the government should include the aspects of reproductive work while defining the definition of productive work and in what ways can we do that? i don't think they should i don't think they should i think what i've been saying is that they should measure productive work better that's all i'm saying uh, should reproductive work be included in productive work reproductive work care work should be recognized but are you going to count it as part of gdp does it make sense does it help to count it as okay let's look at it from a policy point of view a woman who goes to collect water uh, has to who spends 4 hours collecting water say for example in a very dry area uh, she um, <clears throat> so her work is then counted as part of suppose it's counted as part of gdp um and then when she, a tap comes in a house the gdp will fall so uh helping reproductive work sharing reproductive work those are the solutions i think just bringing it in as part of gdp it won't help in the policy so it won't change people's ideas that's my opinion. yeah because at the end productive work whatever phase is more recognized and uh, is more calculate calculable so yeah i understand what you're saying thank you i think you i mean uh, my point what i've been saying and to answer the first question was that reproductive work has to be recognized it has to be recognized it has to be shared it has to be supported but but yeah but there's no point in calculating gdp it will neither lead to the sharing nor will it lead to the supporting nor will it lead to the um uh, uh, to the uh, what was it searching and searching anyway it won't lead to reproductive work i think the sharing part is the most important because if you sh- if it's shared then the support in terms of crashes and other things will come much faster thank you ma'am is this working <coughs> uh, good afternoon ma'am it's it was such a pleasure listening to you uh, and thank you for a very insightful lecture um my question deals with the organizational structures that emerge within uh, civil society and uh, in my experience of working with civil society organizations a problem that a lot of them face is about scaling up of the ideas so there are organizations which work very well in some pockets of india but when they try to scale up to other parts they do not uh, find with the same kind of success and uh, i would want to know something more about the experience of seva and the, the way it has managed to scale up and uh, do you see that uh, a scaling up of an idea also requires a scaling up of the organization in itself because in a way seva perhaps portrays that kind of a model uh, and if not then uh, what are the alternatives that we can think of thank you i actually had been discussing this with dr shankar earlier also um i uh, as i mentioned to you when we uh, last discussed this i think the uh, scale of um, organizations civil i would call it civil society organizations in india is much smaller than say in bangladesh where in bangladesh the uh, uh, the civil society organizations are huge and people wonder why and my own reading is that it's purely due to the regulation so the civil society organizations in bangladesh grew uh, started growing at a time when bangladesh just became independent there was practically no government there was practically no banks and a lot of the space was taken over by civil society organizations and the policies and laws that even today exist they promote civil society organizations so for example an organization like brac which many of you may have heard of it also has a uh, production 
uh, like we have this Ruab that has a production called Arong. <clears throat> it has a bank, it has big agricultural practices, everything. But it all happens within this one organization called BRAC. They don't have to register 20 organizations. In India, if you have a society, you also have to register trust. If you have a trust, you also have to register cooperative. If you have a cooperative, you also have to register union. So you have to register, 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 and then look after the regulations of all. Um, that's one. Secondly, uh, the government often takes over the work that civil society uh, demonstrate. For example, the whole SEG movement came from uh, civil society. So I think, um, I think uh, uh, it's very country specific. And in our country, what do we mean by scaling up? It can mean the organization replicating what we do more in SEVA, that is we have different SEVAs in different states. It can be the organization itself growing, which not many organizations have been able to do, or it can be the idea going out and both the private sector and public sector pick it up. So I think those are the ways that you can scale. I think there was a student from there. Okay, that'll be the last question. Sorry, guys. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, yeah. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Atmaj Pasilkar. And uh, recently, the Tamil Nadu government started a scheme uh, for young children where earlier they used to get lunch and now they get uh, breakfast as well. And I've heard about the fact that uh, Seva is assisting a lot. And uh, there's this uh, situation where the moms of these children, they uh, prepare the food. So there's a constant quality check as well. So do you believe that uh, there will be long-term benefits of this in the state specifically, and should this be implemented in other states? Thank you, ma'am. Actually, we don't work in Tamil Nadu. Uh, Seva mainly works in the northern states, eastern, western, and somewhat in the northeast. Uh, the, northern, the southern states already have many organizations and are already quite forward in many ways with very good policies, yeah. Uh, but do I think feeding the children will help? Yes, I think so. Um, <coughs> whether we like it or not, or whether we want to acknowledge or not, malnutrition is very high in the country. And uh, especially you will see, you know, a very interesting fact is that you see a real class difference. So, um, say uh, the bottom 40% of children will grow much less or grow as tall as their parents or a little taller. Whereas in the uh, middle class, you see that children are growing much taller than their parents. And it's all a question of nutrition. So I think good nutrition at, in the childhood uh, phase is very important. Um, also, I know that in Tamil Nadu, but also in other, other states, they, uh, the women do, um, they, they do two things. The self-help group prepares food so they are able to get uh, income out of it. Of course, in Kerala, Kerala with Kudumshri, uh, all government functions have been outsourced to self-help groups so that their employment has really increased, uh, which is a good thing. Um, <clears throat> but I think this uh, oversight is very important. Um, so we, in many of our states, we have what we call oversight committees, where in the rural areas and the urban areas, women get together and just watch ICDS. Uh, they also help the, uh, the workers in ICDS, say, or Narega and so on. And I think that's important because if there's no oversight and if the oversight is purely left only to the supervisor, many of the, and especially in the Northern states, a lot of these things of these good schemes uh, don't do so well. So yes, I think it should be replicated. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I think I would like to abuse this position of being the Q&A coordinator over here. I'm not asking you a question, but I'd like to share something uh, that I have 
uh, experienced a while back. I was uh, undertaking a training through UNCTAD um, in gender and international trade. And all that you have mentioned uh, in terms of the problems that persist in our country with respect to women and work and livelihoods and output and how it is calculated, et cetera, seem to be rampant across all developing nations because I had a special module focusing on that. And I had to write an essay about the country's situation from where I come from. And when I was doing the literature review uh, for international trade and the participation of gender, uh, there were many, many, many documents which said that why do we need to uh, even look at the participation of women separately in international trade? Why can we just not measure international trade and call it a day? So I think uh, whatever you said today has resonated tremendously with me personally. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Um, I would also like to take this opportunity today to thank all of you, students, faculty members, uh, colleagues, uh, administrative staff, the IT team especially, and everyone who was involved in uh, making this event a success. Most importantly, I would like to thank our uh, director and Dean of the Faculty, Dr. Jyoti Chandiramani. This entire uh, lecture series is her brainchild, as most of you know. And uh, without her uh, ideas, without her support, without her um, uh, guidance, I will say, uh, we will not be able to bring this to you every year, year on year. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Sudipa Majumdar, our um, deputy director. She has, since the time she's assumed this position, she has been a backbone to all that uh, we enjoy in terms of uh, these academic jewels that uh, are there with us since, um, of course, um, I'd like to thank SIU um, for giving us these, uh, uh, for empowering us to do these things that we do. And uh, last but not the least, once again, uh, Rehana ma'am, thank you so, so, so much for what you've shared with us today. We hope to have you over again. Thank you so much. Please stand up for the national anthem. Thank you. 